Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for coming this evening. The title of tonight's event is Ocean-Based Entrepreneurship, Renewable Energy, Aquaculture, and More. As you can see, we're going to be filming tonight's event, and the, uh, the film will be played on Cable Channel 21. You can go to sbchannels.tv for a listing of the times that it will be shown. And right now, I'd like to take a moment to thank all of our sponsors. They make it possible for us to put on these events, and we really appreciate their support. Our premium sponsors are Riviera Insurance Services, Bank of the West, Radius Commercial Real Estate and Investments, Nasif Hicks, Harris & Company, Certified Public Accountants, Stradling Yaka, Carlson & Ralph, Attorneys at Law, Vices LLC, Enterprise Software Development, Pacific Coast Business Times, CIO Solutions, Express Employment Professionals, and our two newest sponsors are Merrill Lynch Wealth Management and SoCal IP Law Group. Our supporting sponsors are Alma Rosa Winery, Newshawk, Mission Ventures, and EVC, Economic Vitality Corporation. Now I'd like to introduce our moderator for this e evening's program, Dan Brooks. Dan is a senior engineer with MWH Americas, Inc. He is currently managing energy efficiency and business optimization projects for Vandenberg Air Force Base. For the past five years, he has managed over $8 million of environmental investigation and remediation projects at Vandenberg Air Force Base. Dan is a graduate of MIT, earning a Bachelor's of Science in Environmental Engineering. He's also a graduate of UCSB, earning a Master's of Science in Mechanical and Environmental Engineering, as well as a Certificate of Graduate Management Practice. He is also a director of the MIT Enterprise Forum of the Central Coast. Dan has served on the board of the MIT Enterprise Forum of the Central Coast for over six years. He has been an MIT admissions interviewer since 1999 and regional chairman of the MIT Education Council since 2001. And quickly, I want to also mention next month's event, which will take place on Wednesday, February 16th. It's titled, And the Bandwidth Played On. And our keynote speaker, we're very fortunate to have him, is Andrew Siebold, and he will be discussing uh, bandwidth limitations and how that will affect us as consumers and potential entrepreneurs. And now I'm going to turn it over to Dan Brooks. Thanks, Adam. I want to thank uh, Adam Jones and also Peter Hartman for their help organizing tonight's program. Uh, I would like to thank our speakers for sharing their time with us tonight. And I want to thank all of you for uh, turning out. Uh, this is going to be a really informative evening. This is the first time, I think, that, that our group has done something focused on uh, ocean-based opportunities for entrepreneurs and startups. Um, so we'll start out with uh, Brent Dielson, who's the founder and CEO of Ecomerit, which is a startup venture focused on uh, generating electrical power from wave currents and tidal energy. Uh, then. Dr. Paul Olin, an aquaculture expert from the University of Cal California Sea Grant Extension Program, will discuss uh, the opportunities on the California coast and elsewhere for o open ocean aquaculture. Uh, and then a uh, late addition to our program, we're happy to have uh, Bernard Friedman, who is the president of Santa Barbara Mariculture, and he'll talk about his efforts growing oysters and mussels offshore. Um, so following the presentations, uh, we'll convene a panel discussion, and Lad Handelman will join us. Uh, he's a deep sea diving pioneer and founder and CEO of Oceaneering International and Cal Dive International. And Mr. Handelman will share uh, his point of view on opportunities for startups uh, related to undersea, oil extraction, sunken treasure recovery, and a, and a number of other marine topics. And at that point, we'll open it up to the audience for questions. Uh, so without further ado, uh, let me welcome Brent Dielson. Thanks, Dan, for the invitation to speak to everybody here this evening. OK, instructions on the clicker. Um, I thought I'd go into a little bit of, of our background. It's relevant, I think, from the entrepreneurial aspect of the topic this evening. And uh, 
and kind of how we use that as a, as a template for the marine energy technology that we're looking at. This is a kind of a brief or short timeline of, of what we've been doing. It uh, obviously doesn't encompass everything, but quite a bit of activity. Uh, going back to the early 70s, I, 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 Ecomerit is a, a company that I founded with my father, Jim. Um, he started a company called Triflon, which was a, a Teflon-based lubricant back in the 70s. And at that time, as you know, the, the oil embargo and the crisis and all that, there's quite a focus on energy efficiency. And uh, kind of through that focus and understanding the efficiencies of machinery and the application for the lubricant, um, it, it drove him to, you know, after he sold that company, to look at renewables in the early 80s. And at that time, it was, um, it was similar to what we're looking at in marine energy today. It was, uh, the technology was very nascent. It, um, it, we are importing quite a bit of it from, from Europe. And uh, the kind of domestic technology had not had been neglected; it hadn't been developed. Um, so all through through the 80s, uh, through, through the 80s and 90s, uh, Zon Systems, which was the, the wind energy company that he founded, um, uh, progressed and eventually started manufacturing wind turbines to compete with the European turbine manufacturers. Uh, fast forward to kind of a very bumpy ride through uh, the, the, the industry and wind industry contracting and expanding and contracting. Um, in, the, in, the, in the late 90s, uh, he was able to sell the company to, to Enron. And uh, that lasted, you can see on the timeline, for a short bit until that imploded. Um, and uh, that was then picked up by GE. So all the GE wind energy effort is the result of that platform that's developed at Zond. Uh, during that period of the Enron transaction, uh, I set up shop with them, I had worked at Zond with them, um, and then we both left kind of on the operational side and started Dielsen Associates. Uh, out of that came Clipper Wind Power, which is, um, uh, it's a wind company based in CARP uh, here. Uh, it's had, you know, seen, you know, high growth since it's it much faster growth than Zon did, and um, it was a fairly kind of intense, uh, intense ride. Um, we went through commercialization of, uh, of a large uh, wind turbine, it's a two and a half megawatt machine that has a, a, um, a rotor the size of a football field to kind of give you a sense of scale. And we manufacture that not in Carpinteria, but in, um, in Iowa, in Cedar Rapids. And uh, the blades come from Brazil. It's a you know, very intense logistical challenge. Uh, anyway, the, uh, out, of the, out of Deals Associates came, came Clipper. But at, this, at the same time, uh, and actually just prior to Clipper, we were working on marine energy technology, which was, uh, I'll show you some slides in a second. But the, um, the, uh, the drivetrain that came out of that became the, the basis or the platform for the Clipper turbine. And um, uh, as we've uh, kind of, there's a, I did a little amendment here on the Clipper, it's now sold to UTC, my C got kind of chopped off there, I gotta work on the slide a little bit. But the, uh, as of last month, um, we're completely out of, uh, out of Clipper, which is kind of a, uh, you know, bittersweet a little bit. Uh, I'd like to be involved in, in that company longer, but uh, it's in good hands with UTC and uh, United, United Technologies. And uh, over the last few years, uh, while we've been working on you know, Clipper and this transaction with UTC and that relationship, we started Ecomerit Technologies, which is the um, kind of the, 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 the framework for the marine energy technologies. And in that is, uh, I'll talk to, talk to a few technologies we're working on there. Um, touch. Uh, mostly on Clipper, um, I just, it's relevant, you know, not just like we're here to look at, you know, marine technologies, but as far as our template to how we intend to grow the marine technologies, um, the wind industry is a, a good template. And um, uh, through, uh, through the different fundraising and the technology development process, uh, we've had the support of de the Department of Energy with different grant funding, 
this occurred at Zond and at Clipper, where they were helpful in the early days in funding the technology risk. So there was grant funds that we received that allowed us to not get um, um, taken to the cleaners by VCs in order to fund that initial uh, engineering effort. Um, and it gave us some staying power to be able to kind of realize you know, private equity once we had um, been able to create a more viable uh, technology, more proven, and uh, later allowed us to go to an IPO and then kind of the, the, the next chapter on with UTC. And you know, part of, part of the, the strategy with Clipper and the wind side also applies to the marine side, and that's differentiated technology. Clipper was different in that it had um, four, four generators, which um, it's, it's a, a very useful thing to have as you're servicing the machines. You don't have to bring a large crane out to service them. So um, it's kind of an oversimplified definition. There's a lot of work behind the scenes to make that work. Um, but it's, uh, without that differentiation, I'm not sure that Clipper would have been able to, you know, uh, stand out and, 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 and raise the capital that it, ha that it, that it needed. So as we, you know, look at that as a template, there's two marine technologies we're working on. One's a Qantas, which is an ocean current turbine. It resembles, you can see kind of the pictures down below, it resembles two uh, wind turbines kind of connected to each other. It, it, uh, and we up here is listed kind of the, the different grant funding that we've received uh, over time and recently to help, uh, to help move that along. On the right is a different technology. It's a wave energy converter, which we call Centipod. And um, the, the pods articulate up and down. They pump hydraulic fluid to a central um, station on the platform to produce electricity. And both of these are normally they're moored off, offshore. The, the thing that's, that, that we saw that we were trying to, to address was the, the, the huge resource in the Gulf Stream off, off Florida. Um, just some nominal statistics, it's 50 times the mass tra transport of, the globe, of all the rivers on the globe. And, um, you know, that little dot there is about 1,000 megawatts. It's, you know, it's a, um, a substantial resource. It's not without challenges, but that's kind of, that's the prize. And that's, um, it's a very unique resource. It's not global. There's a few other currents like the Kuroshio current off Japan, but there's, there's not um, other currents that are sufficiently strong enough to, to create cheap electricity or competitive electricity. Um, and I differentiate this from, from tidal, where you have kind of the ebb and flow. It's different from that. It's unidirectional. Uh, current and it's kind of a different problem you're solving for in tidal you're solving for you know the on again off again ebb and flow of the of the tide plus extreme um, more extreme conditions higher velocities and and increased uh, turbulence and uh, this is kind of the you know the basic configuration it's uh, it's it's a compared to wind it's a little bit more of a benign environment from a structural loading perspective because the, uh, the Gulf Stream is really consistent, it's like one and a half meters per second on average, you know, all throughout the year, unlike wind energy where you, you, have, to, you have to solve for 150 mile an hour gusts, and so your engineering is based off of around, you know, these extreme, extreme load cases. And then uh, kind of on the other end of the spectrum, we have Centipod, which um, it does not seep in high uh, conditions. It's in a very harsh environment. Uh, the, the kind of the basic design parameters require you to uh, design to a 20 meter um, wave to be able to survive that. And so there's you know different things we're working on to be able to be com to be compliant with that with the structure. But uh, you know that's kind of that's the big the big hurdle. And you need, to, you need some scale on these things in order to get the cost of energy that comes off them to be competitive in order to, to compete in, against fossil fuels or, any, or wind energy for that matter. This is uh, kind of a little hard to see on this chart, but it, you know, the, you can, you, the darker colors on the, on the dots are the higher wave energy resources. 
around the globe. And um, you can see in you know, our, our part of the world, the Pacific Northwest up to Alaska is, is, is viable, except for you need to be near load. So that kind of, you know, Alaska isn't necessarily very practical because the, you have to transmit the energy. So you have not only, you know, Washington, Oregon, and I'll, I'll bring up a slide on California just because I thought it may be of interest to the folks here. Um, the, the larger markets in the UK and Europe where they have fairly high tariffs to, uh, to support the, the deployment and development. And then you can see, you know, South Africa and Australia, New Zealand and, uh, and, uh, and Chile. So in California, and I guess I should, um, my preamble to this is uh, we're not necessarily aggressively going after the California market with our device today. It's, um, as you can imagine, the permitting and the regulatory environment, it's, it's very challenging. And um, I think it's going to be just a slow, steady push on that. But uh, in my view, there's, there's nothing eminent, at least in, in what we're working at or what we're looking at. Um, so if you look at the, the little chart there, you can see the blue or red line. Um, just below that, you can't probably make that out, but the, below that is the going from San Diego to Eureka on that chart. And so right at point conception is where the resource begins. And um, so as far as Santa Barbara is concerned, any wave energy resource that would be potentially tapped would be north of point conception. Um, and kind of a huge stretch is out beyond the Channel Islands, which I don't think is, um, I'm not sure we'll live to see that, that day. Uh, in kind of nominal numbers for the Santa Barbara area, it's about 600 megawatts of, of potential. That's, you know, pretty, pretty rough, rough estimate. I, I just threw this in here. Um, it, it's uh, not that interesting, I <laughs> think, to talk to you, but the, we focus quite a bit on where the costs are that, that drive, the, the, drive the design, drive the ultimate configuration. You can see in the purple, the operations and maintenance is, is, is a huge number. And you know, probably what's not shown there is the variability in that. And until you can really give some certainty around those numbers, you're going to have a hard time financing the projects uh, and get them deployed. And so you know, all of these different areas, and O&M being a huge one, is. Uh, we have to create some, some certainty for the financial institutions when we go to project finance. This, oh, this uh, didn't show up very well in the chart. Um, you have to use your imagination a little bit. Um, it's, it's the uh, timeline of, um, of, uh, of the energy change between going from wood to renewables. And um, I'll do, point it out a little bit. This part right here is, is wood. This section is coal. And then you've got natural gas. And then you've got renewables up here. And so it's uh, that, that the transition over time is very slow and deliberate. Um, and I make the case because if you look at at this relative to the expectations in the investment community around kind of high tech, you look at you know just the sale, the transition from personal you know audio. This is just you know the data storage for or you know from from audio tapes to to MP3s. I mean we all know this how quickly things have changed. When you go to to the financial institutions, th there's a short view, there's a short time horizon on you know, the expectations. When you look at the transition from energy resources over time, uh, we're nowhere in, in that timeline. And that's one of the reasons why, um, you know, the support from the DOEs is, is critical. This slide gives you a little, a little view on, on countries that have seen larger penetrations of renewables, solar and wind. Um, you have Denmark at the top with 18% of their energies from wind and solar. And then this is an order of, you know, there's no country, other countries besides Portugal and Spain, and they're, you know, 12, 11%. What's driving that is their, the number next to that is their retail price for energy. 
So, you know, it's not coincidental, obviously, that, you know, Denmark with $295 per megawatt hour for the retail price for energy, they're going to get a huge amount of renewable penetration because it's, it's, you know, obviously it's, anything's competitive at, that, at those rates. And you have the same paradigm with uh, Portugal and Spain. If you look at U.S., uh, you know, we might, I don't know if by rounding, we might be closer to 2%, but, you know, at $95 per megawatt hour, we're, we're not going to achieve kind of the large um, renewable penetration that we'd like based off of tariffs. So what we've been doing in the U.S., and, and by the way, I just layered in the cost of competing energy sources in there just to kind of make it uh, a relevant picture. So what's driving the U.S. market's been in, in uh, instead of in the tariffs, which is not politically, um, uh, it's kind of political suicide if, 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 politi if politically they you know, were trying to increase tariffs, um, it's not going to go over well. The, in the inflation that would, you know, that would occur from now, it's untenable. So what's happened is everything's been done in the tax code. And um, this, this graph shows kind of wind, the experience of wind since the, since the 80s and the growth. And, you know, it's obviously directly correlated to the tax structures that were in place. Um, uh, the little blip in the beginnings when the Fed and California taxes in the early 80s expired, there was a long dry period. Um, the PTC, which is the production tax credit, that's the dominant tax credit for, for wind came into place in, in uh, 93, 94, and uh, it was, uh, didn't really have a, a huge impact until you coupled that with high natural gas prices. So, so the little chart below, I just you know, did a little you know, comparison there so you can kind of see the spike in, in natural gas. So those two things combined are what drove wind. Um, the, the tax code and tax um, benefits for, for marine are um, you know, at this point for a nascent in, uh, technology, they're, they're not sufficient enough to kind of drive or, or, or substantiate a market to drive the technology and pull it through from an investment perspective. Um, and these are, you know, just a few things that in the marine side that we need to try and get in place somehow. It's kind of, this is kind of a market basket of things, but it's, you know, the R&D funding, um, Incentives on the cap installed capital cost of the, for the technology, um, production tax credits, um, carbon credits, um, those type of things need to be in place in order for the marine energy industry in the U.S. to take off meaningfully. Um, these are all things that have existed before at one time or another in wind or other other energy um, uh, other energy fields, and so it's. They're not exotic ideas, but they take a lot of work to try and you know, get in place. And, and I have to say, I mean, as you look at this as kind of a subsidized industry, um, kind of the, the counter to that is um, if, if fossil fuels carried their full externalities, um, it, it, would, it would be a level playing field. And so as long as we're dealing with, with kind of that, uh, that not being in equilibrium, yeah, there has to be some incentives in place for renewables. And so this kind of, uh, I, thought I, I thought I should probably put a different slide in here, a happier one, but this is kind of that valley of death when it comes to financing uh, a new, new entrepreneur venture. Um, the cash flow required to kind of sustain through this period is, um, is pretty substantial and to the extent that you don't have that market there, especially in the U.S., um, it's hard to rationalize the enterprise value that you need to to raise the money. Um, and, uh, and so in the meantime, we try and hobble together different grant funding and whatnot to kind of get through that, that, uh, that period. And uh, also simultaneously kind of push on kind of the incentives that need to be put in place. So that's, um, that's, uh, that's kind of the entrepreneurial view of what we're doing in marine energy. And, um, I think I'll pass the, uh, the mic on to Dan. Thank you. Thanks, Brent. Thanks, Brent. Uh, our next speaker is going to be Paul Oland from the University of California, 
Sea Grant uh, Extension Program. And he's going to discuss uh, opportunities on the California coast and elsewhere for open ocean aquaculture. Good evening. I'm very pleased to be here, and it's a pleasure for me to address you and talk to you about aquaculture. And what I'd like to do is present a picture from a global perspective on where our seafood comes from and what our seafood needs are going to be. And then I'll move that into some of the uh, systems that are used and some of the potential that's out there on the horizon. And then we're, we're fortunate to have um, a real entrepreneur and, and pioneer in, in offshore aquaculture here on the West Coast, and Bernard Friedman, who will follow me and talk about some of his experiences um, operating a mussel farm. A brief overview of my presentation, I'll talk to you about why we should be interested in aquaculture and why we need aquaculture. I'll cover some of the systems and species that are in use, and then I'll talk a little specifically about why marine aquaculture is on the horizon. So why aquaculture? World fisheries are at a plateau, and they have been for a number of decades, and I've got some graphics that will well, reinforce this in just a moment. Um, the United Nations predicts global demand for seafood will increase 40 million tons in the next 20 years. Um, to give you an idea of perspective, um, our total capture fisheries are about 80 to 90 million metric tons. So in the next 20 years, we're going to need seafood, additional seafood comparable to about 50% of the total world's capture fisheries today. Uh, the Food and Health and the World Health Organization highlight the health benefits of eating seafood, lowers risk of death from coronary heart disease, and in some age groups as much as a 40% reduction in your risk of, of a, a fatal coronary heart attack. Um, that's a phenomenal reduction based on something as simple as eating a little bit more fish. It enhances brain development and cognition in babies as evidenced by increased IQs and better socialization later on in life. Um, lowers risk of depression and dementia in aging populations, and all of this simply by eating more seafood, primarily oily seafood. Um, the Public Library of Science has identified low seafood intake as the second largest cause of diet-related deaths in America. So how much seafood are we eating? About 16 pounds a year on average. You can see there it's been relatively stable. But FDA recommends to take advantage of some of the health benefits I just mentioned, we should be eating twice as much seafood. To put this into perspective on a global scale, we eat about 16 pounds a year. Koreans, for example, eat about 60. I mentioned that commercial fishery harvest has plateaued. If you look at this graph, it starts out uh, in the 1950s. After the war, a lot of soldiers all over the world became fishermen. And you can see the fishery harvest increased pretty dramatically. Um, up until around the 70s, it started to taper off a little bit. At that point in time, many countries started to establish exclusive economic zones and encourage increased fishing capacity through low interest loans and a number of other means. Um, as you can see, they were very successful. Fishery harvest rose until about the late 1980s, and as you can see there, it's plateaued now, and it's, it's fluctuating between about 80 or 90 million metric tons a year. Um, no one believes it's going to increase substantially in the future beyond that level. To give you an idea of what a million metric tons is, if you imagine 250 football fields and you covered all those football fields with 40-foot ocean-going containers and filled them all to the brim with seafood, you'd have a million metric tons. So you saw there that in the late 1980s, um, captive fisheries pretty much plateaued. People didn't stop needing more and more fish in the succeeding decades, but they got it through aquaculture. Look at the late 1980s there. You can see a dramatic acceleration in aquaculture production throughout the world. The tiny little sliver at the red of each of those bars, that's U.S. aquaculture production. You can see we are a player. We're a very small player. Um, but most significantly, our slice of that bar hasn't changed much over the last 20 years. Um, we produce less than 1% of the aquacultured seafood in the world. We're the third largest seafood consuming nation in the world. This is not a new problem. Almost 40 years ago, Jacques Cousteau said, with Earth's burgeoning human population to feed, we must turn to the sea with new understanding and new technology. We need to farm it as we farm the land. And he went on to say further that we must plant the sea and herd its animals, using the sea as farmers instead of hunters, 
That, after all, is what civilization is all about. Farming replacing hunting. So why aquaculture in America? If you look at the blue bars there, those are seafood imports. The United States, so in 2008, imported 89% of the seafood we eat. In 2009, we imported 90% of the seafood that we eat. Um, now, annually, we've got a $10 billion a year trade deficit simply in seafood. And then if you had asked me five years ago if we had uh, any food security issues, I would have said no. Today I would say we do have a seafood security issue. And real quickly, I'd like to give you some of the reasons why I think that. Um, the global food needs are going to soar by 50% over the next 40 years. And I mentioned that in the next 20 years, we'll need an additional 40 million metric tons of seafood. Um, China has 1.3 billion people. India has 1.2 billion people. Most of the population growth in the future is going to take place in Asia. As they develop larger and larger and more affluent middle classes, they're going to be purchasing and consuming a lot of the seafood that we import today. If you look at global aquaculture production, it's dominated by China. 43 million metric tons a year. Indonesia is an order of magnitude less than that at four, um, followed by India, Vietnam, and the Philippines at three and a half, two and a half, and 2.4 million metric tons per year, respectively. Um, the U.S. Department of Commerce has recognized both the fact that we have a huge seafood trade deficit and a huge opportunity to produce seafood um, and to provide, provide employment opportunities. In 1999, they convened a group who determined that we could increase our U.S. seafood production through aquaculture from a half a million to 1.5 million tons per year by 2025, um, increasing the value of that product from one to three billion dollars. And this additional production was going to take place um, primarily through 760,000 tons of fin fish, almost 600,000 of which would be marine fin fish, 47,000 tons from crustacean aquaculture, and almost a quarter of a million tons from mollusk production. This was predicated on a 10% per year annual increase in production. And over the last decade, we haven't seen that. Here's North American aquaculture production. These numbers actually include Canada. But as you can see, while aquaculture production has increased, um, over the last six or eight years, it's pretty much stabilized. Um, over the last decade, aquaculture production in the United States increased on an average of 1.7% uh, as an annual percentage rate increase, far below the 10 um, that was looked at as what might provide us with some of that seafood we would need. Here you can see again, this is U.S. finfish production trends of, of five of the major species that are produced. And you can see that's, that's about as, as flat a production line as you could see. Now I'd like to talk just briefly to the economics of aquaculture production. And this is a study that was just completed in September of 2010 by the Department of Fisheries and Oceans Canada. Um, I think most of you are aware that aquaculture production, particularly net pen aquaculture production, is fairly controversial. Um, there are some um, significant opposition groups in British Columbia who are encouraging the government to move towards some kind of a closed containment system for aquaculture. So the department commissioned a group to do a study on the economics of aquaculture production. What I'd like to do is ask you to look at the two top production technologies in yellow, net pens and recirculating systems. The initial investment is the second column over. If you jump to the far right, you can see the return on investment. 52% versus 4%. I'd also draw your attention to the fact that every return on investment number below that is negative. And those systems in the blue are primarily uh, high technology intensive recirculating systems. The culture densities are very, very high. Um, but as you can see, the return is not there. And then the two bottom are land-based systems. One would be an in-ground pond, the other would be an, an above-ground bermed pond. You can take a look at the initial investment ranging from $5 million for this hypothetical production system of a net pen to $72 million for a land-based grade system. So looking at these two technologies that at this point in time look as, as a way that you might produce some of the seafood that we need and, and actually have a successful business doing it, um, these ocean net pens are some of the exciting new technologies that are out there. Um, 
net pen design and engineering has um, improved phenomenally over the last 20 years. Um, on the left-hand side, top and bottom, you can see some more traditional, uh, what we call gravity systems. Basically, it's, it's a net that's, that's weighted at the bottom, floats at the surface. In the center there is a picture from a, a sea station, which is a trademarked aquaculture net pen system that's designed by an engineering firm in Washington State. Um, these have been very successful and they can be operated at depth such that you can use open ocean conditions which often are subject to very severe weather systems um, and they're unaffected by that. And the aquapod you see in the upper right is another uh, submersible system. Recirculating aquaculture systems have, have largely been um, reserved for niche species that have a very high value. And a good example here in, in California would be fish that are marketed, that are sold live, primarily in ethnic markets throughout the state, well, throughout the country for that matter, but they, they command a very high price, and therefore you can afford the, the higher cost of operating a recirculating facility. Um, to improve the economics of this, one of the primary things you can do is, is use genetic selection and other techniques to improve growth, growth rates in the fish that you're raising. Which comes to which fish are you going to raise? Um, in terms of selection criteria, growth rate's very important. Uh, available technology is also something you need. Disease resistance is very desirable, obviously. Uh, hardiness, and you want to make sure that you've got strong markets for your product once it's ready to enter the marketplace. If you look at that graph there pretty quickly, on the left-hand side, you can see a red bar that, that very rapidly escalates. Upward to the right, you can see a small blue segment that shows that same trajectory rapidly escalating. Um, these are cobia on the left, the red bar, and you can see a picture of a cobia in the lower left. And then the blue bar that you see there is a California yellowtail, which is another promising species that's in the early stages of commercial development. And then the other three, the purple is a white sea bass, the green is a boccaccio, and the black is a halibut. All of which are species for which we have hatchery culture technology, but as you can see, if you're going to grow a fish and you want a fast-growing fish, those wouldn't be the ones you would select. Some of the new species that we have that are currently in culture um, and relatively recently from the, the upper left clockwise, California yellowtail, kahala, Hawaiian moi, the kobe I mentioned previously, and then I will um, talk briefly about uh, an aqua advantage Atlantic salmon, and this is a genetically engineered fish that's under uh, regulatory review. So Aqua Bounty Technologies is a, a Massachusetts company. They've been working for about 20 years to genetically engineer an Atlantic salmon for improved performance and growth. Um, they've developed a fish that grows to market in half the time. They've done this by taking a growth hormone from a Chinook salmon, inserting that into an Atlantic salmon, and that growth hormone is then regulated by a piece of DNA that they've extracted from an ocean pout, which you can see a picture of in the lower right-hand corner there. Um, it's a fish that's uh, found in very cold waters in the North Atlantic, and it's essentially what that regulator does is results in the production of growth hormone year-round. So you see accelerated growth. They grow much faster. They don't grow bigger. They just get to market size in half the time. Aqua Bounty Technologies applied to the FDA for approval of this fish in 1995, about 15 years ago. It's been under review for 15 years, and their plan for commercialization is to maintain brood stock and produce eggs in Prince Edward Island, to ship those eggs to a secure site in Panama where they will conduct their grow out and processing and then ship that product back to the United States to market. Um, the fish would be 95% sterile, triploid, and all female. As I said, they applied for this in, the, in 1995. It's been under review since then by numerous agencies and the Veterinary Medicine Advisory Committee, which is a group of experts who are advisory to the Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. So the Veterinary Medicine Advisory Committee um, undertook this review and they issued a report to the Commissioner of the Food and Drug Administration. This 100-page summary report concluded that the aqua advantage salmon are safe, they're nutritionally comparable to other Atlantic salmon, and they're not a threat to the environment. They found there to be substantial, reliable information in the environmental assessment document to conclude that aqua advantage Atlantic salmon are not expected to have a significant impact on the environment. 
Further, they wanted to say that we have a high degree of certainty in our conclusions regarding aqua advantage salmon. So FDA brought the best available science to review an application, and these are the results of that review committee. However, there's considerable public opposition to this, and, and legislators um, have been contacted with a great deal of frequency by constituents who are, who are concerned about this. Um, how this will be re resolved, I'm not sure. I would hope that it would be resolved in the scientific arena, not the political one, but we'll wait and see how that turns out. So why do we need aquaculture? Let me summarize just a minute. We, it would be beneficial for America to reduce our seafood trade deficit. We all know that we need job creation in the nation today. It would be an economic stimulus through multipliers, would reduce pressure on wild fish stocks, all of which are fish, fished about to capacity at this point in time. Um, aquaculture is a more efficient use of fish meal and feeds. It would reduce the carbon footprint if we could grow fish close to where they're consumed. Then we'd see improved health for Americans and reduced medical costs that would result from that. So why marine aquaculture? Well, the ocean covers about 70% of the surface of the planet and has 97% of our water. I mentioned that capture fisheries are maxed out, about 80 to 90 million metric tons a year. This is about 1.2% of all the food that people in the world eat that comes from the oceans. Marine aquaculture at 36 million metric tons is about a half a percent of the total. So we get less than 2% of the food that we eat from the ocean. Recirculating aquaculture production today is negligible, and it, largely that's a result of the increased costs of that technology. As I mentioned earlier, if you had a fish that grew faster, then all of a sudden recirculating technologies would be much more economically competitive, and you could site farms right by the population centers where those fish are going to be consumed. Freshwater resources we all know are limiting. Ocean net pen aquaculture is a, it's a new industry. It's rapidly developing and evolving new technologies. Um, hatchery technology and policy framework are, are big hurdles that need to be overcome. But on the science side, I know the hatchery technology can. On the political side, the regulatory and policy framework is something that's evolving right now. It's being developed in California. It's being developed at the, at the national level. And the National Marine Fisheries Service and NOAA should come out with an aquaculture policy, um, I would suspect, in the next couple of months. It's been in the works for easily the last six months. It's only a six-page document, so hopefully we'll be able to see it come out in not too long. Marine aquaculture is practiced sustainably in, in other countries that, that we recognize as having strong environmental protection and, and ethics, among them Australia, Canada, Chile, China, the, the EU, Japan, Korea, and Norway. I mentioned the needs that we've got for research uh, and hatchery technology. The holy grail in aquaculture are bluefin tuna, which were, are hugely threatened in the world's oceans today, and yellowfin tuna. Both of these species in the last uh, six years or so have been successfully cult cultured in captivity. That is, captive broodstock have been successfully stoned and their offspring have been successfully raised. Survival rates are abysmal. They're so low that there's no way in the world that this is a competitive technology at this point in time. But I'm confident that if we focus some of our um, research expertise in this nation that we can overcome these, these hurdles. I mentioned some of the controversies surrounding aquaculture here in the United States and in particularly in California, I think we've got some good environmental regulations in place such that we can ensure that this industry can develop without um, having an adverse impact on the environment and in fact being truly sustainable. Um, there's obviously in California and in the nation a strong public and private ethic. Um, Ecosystem-based management is, is the, the mantra in terms of management of coastal and ocean resources at this point in time. Um, and we've got stringent regulatory problems that are already in place to cover most of the concerns that you hear expressed. Use of drugs and therapeutics is closely managed by the Food and Drug Administration and EPA. Water quality is, is uh, closely protected by EPA through the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System permitting process. Um, prevention of introductions is covered by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the natural resource agencies in most states. Um, and we've got excellent food safety and HACCP programs for seafood that are, in fact, the model for programs in mo most countries in the world. So, American do can do this. The question is, should we? Thanks for your attention.
Thanks, Paul. I'd like to invite now uh, Bernard Friedman, uh, who is the president of Santa Barbara Mariculture, and he'll talk about his efforts growing oysters and mussels offshore. Uh, prior to starting Santa Barbara Mariculture, he was a commercial diver for Ecomar, which harvested mussels from the legs of the offshore oil platforms. Um, also, I want to take the opportunity to identify one of our guests tonight, Heather McIntyre, uh, who is the California State uh, Aquaculture Coordinator. Uh, if anyone has any questions uh, related to aquaculture, um, we'll have a, a, a panel discussion here, and then you can speak to Heather after the event. Thanks. Cue this uh, slideshow up. Hi, my name is uh, Bernard Freeman, and uh, I own and operate the only off offshore shellfish farm on the west coast here. Uh, this farm is uh, 70 acres large and is located three quarters of a mile off the coast of Hope Ranch right here in town. I grow Pacific oysters and Mediterranean mussels which hang on submerged long lines 20 to 30 feet below the surface. Uh, the water depth is approximately 70 to 90 feet. Uh, gonna be a little unconventional today. I'm just gonna roll some pictures um, I'm going to tell you a little story of how I started out and my thoughts on what I've learned so far and try to inspire you on the future of aquaculture right here in the Santa Barbara Channel. Uh, so just, this, is, uh, this is my boat and this is the farm uh, just off the coast. Uh, I try to operate my business with as much transparency as possible. If you have any further questions, I, I'm at the farmer's market. I'm all over town here. I'm easy to find. I have no trade secrets, nothing to hide. Uh, you know, this business is for the deeply committed, uh, and uh, quite frankly, the, it changes all the time every year. It just gets better and better and as I learn and grow. Uh, this business started out as an idea. I wanted to see if I could make money growing oysters in the Santa Barbara Channel. Uh, it's not a completely crazy idea. I just finished uh, a master's thesis called Developing offshore oyster culture in the Santa Barbara Channel. <laughs> so I'm full of confidence. Uh, it, it started out very simple. Uh, I made a couple of phone calls. I borrowed a kayak. I started the process of certifying the water for shellfish harvesting with the California Department of Public Health. I put in one long line. I bought some oyster seed. I put them in nets and they hung them on my long line. Santa Barbara Mariculture was born. One year later, I started selling these oysters at the farmer's market. I can't say it's been all peaches and cream for the last eight years. Uh, in fact, it's, it's been the opposite. Uh, much uh, sweat, blood, and tears have been shed. Um, uh, it's it's kind of like being a parent. It's one of the hardest things you'll ever do, but one of the most rewarding things. Uh, this business is not for the faint of heart. It's an adventure with no destination. And I always seem to be looking in the mirror for inspiration. Uh, when I first started out, I thought some of my biz biggest obstacles would be weather, government regulations, and environmentalists and fishermen both objecting to my business. These fears did not materialize. Instead, completely different set of obstacles materialized, uh, for which I could not have accounted for. Um, and they definitely impacted my production cycles. Uh, public enemy, enemy number one, the Scoter Surf Duck. <laughs> it, uh, it migrates here, uh, through here once a year, and it loves baby mussels. Um, no, I do not shoot them or harm them in any way. I simply lower the mussels when they come through here, and they can't dive down past 45 feet. I know that for a fact. <laughs> uh, I have uh, currents were another thing. I have raging currents that you would never see and I've dragged my gear around out there. I've, I've uh, had to redesign my anchors and, uh, and demoic acid. Uh, if, you, if you don't know what demoic acid is, it's a, it's a toxic algal bloom. Um, it's a red tide and uh, it, it impacts uh, marine life such as uh, dolphins and seals 
Uh, we can't eat the shellfish, so I can't bring the shellfish in for harvest. California had its largest domoic acid event ever in the history of California this summer. Uh, it's a completely new environment happening. You know, call it what you will, but uh, it's it's new on the horizon. So ask me about well, this business is farming. Uh, it doesn't matter what you're farming. The key to success is figuring out how to manage all the plants or animals that you are growing and get them to market. It's largely an organizational issue where you have to take the chaos and unpredictability of the environment and take the livelihood of your animals into account. And you have to exert a level of control on the whole operation to make it profitable for us human beings. That's farming. There's nothing magical about it. Uh, so my biggest challenges always boil down to how best to manage the farm. That's the craft. That's the skill. Uh, you can only learn it by getting out there and doing it over and over and over again. I make a lot of mistakes. Uh, and I know that this, you know, doing business in the ocean, it's a deadly place and it can be very costly. And any time you think you know what you're doing, you better be careful. I cannot emphasize this enough. Management is paramount. You have to have the proper resources in place to deal with the unpredictability of nature, with the unpredictable nature of growing animals in the ocean. I seem to make these mistakes every year of not having the right management plan for the right amount of animals. I'm always putting way too much than I can handle. Uh, and I can't always seem for the changing environmental conditions that affect the whole farm. That's the challenge. But yet I survive. Uh, and how, how do you manage the, you know, how do you manage the, your farm? Well, you use machinery, you use technology. Uh, I don't fabricate any of it myself. I import the machinery from other countries and the gear and I adapt them to the farm. There's no need to reinvent the wheel. It already exists. Uh, I believe the technology for growing animals in the ocean is, is here. You just, need to imp you just need to adapt it and refine it to make it work for your particular farming operation in your particular environment. Uh, at the moment, what California needs the most or uh, needs the most for the future development of aquaculture is a hatchery. A facility where you can spawn and produce species to see if they're suitable for open ocean farming. California laws mandate that farmed aquaculture species must not interfere with the surrounding environment. And I believe we can grow a number of suitable species profitably and meet and exceed most environmental guidelines. The emphasis, at least in the beginning, should not be, should be on species suitability to the environment and its farming practices, not necessarily on profitability. You have to learn to crawl before you can walk, and walk before you can run. <clears throat> profitability shouldn't be the number one mo motivator. This country needs sustainable, sustainable seafood like never before. And anyone buying local seafood from any number of vendors here in town knows seafood hasn't been cheap in a long time. Maybe you believe me, maybe you don't. But there's a tremendous future for aquaculture development here in, Santa Bar in the Santa Barbara Channel. This is the Fertile Valley, the breadbasket, call it what you will. It has an amazing, productive, this is an amazing, productive, and fertile stretch of ocean. If the foundations of aquaculture are conscientiously put in place by using the correct species to be farmed and also using the proper management practices, I believe you can easily meet and exceed all state and environmental regulations. I see no reason why aquaculture can't be sustainable here in the Santa Barbara Channel. Last year, I reinvested $30,000 back into my business. It's basically all my profits. I bought new, new equipment, new machinery. I'm all in, and I'm doing the best I can to expand this operation, but I'm just one man. And looking back from where, you know, looking back eight years ago from where I came from, where I first went out and borrowed a kayak, and, uh, you know, to where I am today, even in 
this very morning, uh, in pretty rough weather, I harvested a uh, thousand pounds and close to a thousand oysters just this very morning. And I've come a very long way. Uh, I'm very optimistic, very proud of my accomplishments. And uh, it's a privilege to be out there farming and doing what I'm doing. And it's a commitment I plan to keep. Thank you very much. So now I'd like to ask uh, Lad Handelman to, to join us up here. And yes, please. So Lad Handelman began his career in the ocean as an abalone diver on California's west coast, and then became a founding partner of General Offshore Divers in Santa Barbara, uh, and proceeded to become one of uh, the deep sea diving uh, pioneers of the country. He's the founder of Oceaneering International in 1969. Uh, it's the largest commercial diving contractor in the world with over 1,000 employees and operations in 24 countries. In 1980, a lad founded CalDive International, an oil services contracting firm specializing in construction engineering and underwater installations. And now, now I'd like to, to start out. Uh, lad has put a couple of prompts up here for, for audience questions. He's asked, uh, Rather than him uh, present on a particular topic, if, if you can come up with questions for him. Uh, but before we, we get into that, I'd like to first ask you, Lad, if you have any um, comments or observations about the, the presentations we heard tonight um, with respect to ocean uh, generation of power and also aquaculture. Okay, is my, am I turned on? Yeah. Okay. Well, what I'm going to say may not say well with some of you, but uh, it's, well, I'm going to be honest about how I feel about things. Bernard here, he spoke the truth. If I can work your ass off, hope for good weather, and maybe make, maybe make a living. He thought about profit, he's just making a living. But he bought himself a hard job, a tough job, and unless you've been a fisherman for many, many years, you couldn't even do what he does. Tough road. He's not going out raising money for his venture. He's not selling stocks. He's just working hard. So, Bernard, you get my vote. <laughs> as far as the idea of uh, energy from wind and underwater propellers, the first two presentations we heard, uh, it seemed to me that more important than whether they spent their efforts spent getting cash flow, it'd be nice, but what's the best way spent by getting cash flow from investors, from grants? And I wonder, where's the outcome? Where's the, where's the cash flow? You have to have a business plan that demonstrates, say in five years, maybe more, that you're, you get ultimately a break even. And these gentlemen I know are very great at what they do, but um, they didn't want to be pretty, pretty hard pushed to give any more firm estimate about when they'll be on a break even and probable basis, except in charts. Charts about the world, they don't mean much. Charts about fish going up and down. The issue is can I grow my fish and sell them like Bernard and make a few bucks? Can I get energy? How many KWs can I get and sell to somebody? How long will it take me to sell that? I don't see things in a, but if you can't get it small and make money with it, uh, by doing something, by producing it, uh, then to me that would not be a good business to be in. I don't, I don't believe in the 20, 30 year plan that the government, government wants to. Uh, our government doesn't support it very much. The countries that are doing it and succeeding are all state funded, subsidized uh, countries. So they want it, and it helps them internationally, competitively, but the money has come from subsidized governments. America does not do that. Uh, maybe once in a while. You guys are up against it pretty hard. So I, I'm for, uh, I'm from a school like where I came from. Uh, show me the money. 
when can I load my fish? Now, I, don't, I don't go much further than that. But by sticking to that principle, uh, there was four of us out mowing the others. Didn't have a clue about business. Nothing. Uh, worked out of one of my buddy's garage. It was surrounded by diving companies owned by Westinghouse, New Carbide, uh, big, big construction companies, uh, French, French government, right here in Santa Barbara. Uh, couldn't get a job for 14 months. But what drove us was we don't want to work for anybody. We got our own company that we control and not cater to any big corporation or anybody but ourselves. So I think that the need for uh, to be a free spirit goes a long way, right? You know what I'm telling you what to do. I got fired from the oranges, first came to California, fired saw magazine. I, I don't know Bay very well. So I, I, don't, I don't think I can work that kind of problem. But I know that. To get somewhere that you like, you're a big hammer, you keep hitting that nail if you don't go for it, for but a bigger hammer. Stay focused. And uh, without that, keep me around that. Cash flow, I don't think you get very far. Okay. That's about it. Great. I have a question for, for all four of our uh, panelists. And uh, Bernard, you touched a little bit on it. Um, the ocean is a pretty unforgiving environment uh, for, for people, for, for your structures, for whatever you're growing or, or, or setting in the ocean. I wonder, wonder if you all might uh, address that to some degree. And, and Lad, maybe we'll start with you. Well, you said it right. Uh, the ocean will always beat you at some point. It's assumed and try to go with it, with their forces. You know, to, to go up against them, you lose out. And to do that, yeah, a company's strategy has to be based on a knowledge of how futile it is to go, go against these forces. In time, you just give up. They always win. So the ocean is a, a place that, if it's a last possible resort, put your windmills out there, put your generators. But like I think you should do them on land, or in estuaries or lakes, somewhere where you may be less energy, where you spend most of your life pulling them up, fixing them, putting them down again. Maintenance offshore is almost impossible to, to control. You got any moving things underwater, subject to a thousand things to mess it up for you, uh, whether it's floating debris, uh, algaes, fish, uh, Corrosion, everything's working against you. Uh, I believe in wind energy a lot. I believe in solar energy a lot, but not in the ocean. Your turn, Brian. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I always assume the worst and hope for the best. I have plan A, B, C, D, E. Um, everything you have a own a boat it's always gonna break down you're always gonna be fixing it um, you, you just it's, it's you, nature has its own course and, and we, we're along for the ride and uh, um, yeah I, I people always seem to go in with, I have a plan, and this is how it's going to work, and it never works out that way. <laughs> it never works out that way. And, and we assume that we have a handle on everything, and that we can control everything, and we always make that mistake time and time again. And so um, it's, it's learning. You're going to make mistakes, plan on making the mistakes, adapt and change. And just stay light on your feet, stay quick, and, and be reactive to whatever comes towards your way. I'll just say that we all know that the ocean is a very unforgiving place to operate. Um, but I think we all also know that Americans are good at developing technologies and dealing with challenges. Um, a perfect example of that, I think, is in the evolution of engineering for net pen aquaculture systems. The early 
uh, gravity cages that I showed in one of my slides um, work very well in some situations. In open ocean exposed situations, they don't work very well. Um, a severe ocean storm will often um, destroy a cage like that. But the sea station cages, the submersible cages that I also sh showed some images of, um, are technology that was developed specifically to raise fish in severe exposed ocean conditions. And those cages have been used very successfully in those situations. They've been used successfully in Hawaii. I think all of us have seen some of the satellite photos of the, of the track of Hurricane Katrina as it approached New Orleans. Well, as it passed over um, Puerto Rico, it passed directly over some sea station cages that were full of cobia, and there was no damage whatsoever to those cages. So I think certainly it's a challenging environment. Uh, Americans have successfully address challenges and, and overcome them, and I think that with the appropriate uh, research and application of technology, we can, in fact, sustainably harvest fish in the ocean. Uh, the, uh, the approach that we have to the O&M at this point is, and the, and the maintenance offshore, it's, it's uh, really taking a look at what's going on in offshore wind in Europe, where that industry is growing. And um, there's been a lot of lessons learned through, through that deployment that we'll take and, and apply to what we're doing. Uh, the, I think that the offshore wind is going to continue to be in, in front of what we're doing for a while. So uh, you know, I think we'll realize some benefits from that. Uh, the, the kind of the market driver there, it's a little different than over here. Um, and so we're going to have to uh, continue to look to, to Europe as kind of uh, a leadership in, in the technology development for what we're looking at. Great, thanks. Uh, yep, Paul, another comment. Yeah, I, I just might like to add that I think in, in all of these uh, sectors or endeavors, um, a key word would be the name of Bernard's boat, which is perseverance. <laughs> thanks, I'd like to open it up now to audience questions. Uh, we'll have, uh, Bob and Adam are going to be moving around with microphones, and because we're recording for, for television, uh, I'd like you to put your question into the microphone. So let's we'll start over here. Thank you. Um, Wayne Norris, I've got two quick questions here. Uh, first of which is uh, we used to see kelp cutters, and we don't see them anymore, and I'm just not sure where they went or why they went wherever they went. And the other question is that if I had to create energy on the ocean from a long way from shore, you know, very far at all. Uh, I might be tempted to try to convert it into a useful product like fixed ammonia instead of generating electricity. And they may do that, and I was just wondering to uh, comment on that because I didn't see the energy delivery method being discussed. Well, yeah, you're right. The nominal uh, delivery method is, uh, would be cabling, but uh, there's a lot of work being done on, on trying to localize kind of a, a product base, whether it be kind of an RO system or some other you know, way of creating uh, fresh water uh, with, with the power that you're generating offshore. So yeah, there's, I mean, it's a challenge. So um, the, the cost associated with that kind of infrastructure is, is huge. So uh, the, I think that you'll see a lot of um, if you poke around at the different technologies that are out there, there's, there's a, a huge variety of, of uh, um, interesting uh, approaches to doing what you're saying. Kelp cutter? cutter, I... Anyone have an answer to, to the, uh, the kelp cutter question? No? Well, I can just say the only kelp harvesting that occurs today in California is by hand, and it's done by abalone, abalone grovers to harvest kelp, and they typically cut off about the top three feet of a kelp plant. And if ever there was a plant designed for harvest of that nature, it's probably kelp, which just has phenomenal growth rates. Yeah. Uh, Tom Lord Revere. I had a couple of questions about the mariculture issues, uh, especially off of Hope Ranch. I've kayaked out there many, many times. And uh, you didn't mention, Bernard, about potential outfall from the uh, Goleta waste treatment plant. and. This would be generally, for all mariculture, I think, um, where we have outfalls from sewage plants and their uh, treatment or lack of treatment. And chlorination, I know, has been cut back in the state of California several years ago, which I believe affected 
EcoMars uh, production. And then another question, I think probably uh, Paul uh, talking about ocean open or open ocean uh, mariculture of various fish uh, species. Um, I've read reports about uh, the use of uh, various kinds of um, hormones used, growth hormones in the ocean, open ocean, and the uh, contamination of, of uh, some of the GMO uh, organisms getting out into the open ocean and affecting the wild species. Yeah, this uh, this lease uh, has a has a really interesting history on water quality. Uh, it is the canary in the coal mine. Uh, uh, Jeff, Jeff Young uh, owned and operated this lease in 85. He brought his, uh, he tested the waters and it didn't, the bacteria didn't show up in the water samples, but then he, when he br wanted to bring his, uh, his shellfish uh, to market, uh, he had high bacteria in the, uh, in the meats. And so he changed professions became a lawyer and sued the Cleta water <laughs> treatment plant. <laughs> and he got them to clean, and then he got them to chlorinate the water. And he, and, and for a long time, he sat on the regional water quality board and bird dogged them. And, uh, and, and, and we still do, we still monitor the water. We still are in contact with all tr five wastewater treatment plants. We know about them. Um, they call, they call us when they have treatment problems. Um, and the same thing goes for marine toxins. We, we, I know more about marine toxins than anybody in the state of California. I, I know exactly when they happen, when they occur, what's going on, way before anybody else does. And, and that's what a mariculture, that's what a shellfish farm can do for you. It, it, it is the canary in the coal mine. We see things happen before anybody else does. Oh, I uh, had a venture after I left diving companies. Uh, came back to California, and I thanked uh, myself every day for having been an abalone diver. Being an abalone diver uh, taught me many things and allowed me to make a living. I found out that the amount of abalone offshore had dwindled a lot, and uh, the Merle Bay fishery was shut down altogether because the sea otters came in. But nevertheless, we started an abalone farm. The first offshore leases of actually bottom area on, a, on San Nicolas Island, four acres. I spent a couple hundred thousand dollars of my own money. Uh, uh, we learned how to do spawning and take a spawn at a certain size and plant them on the reefs. So, and hope the farm would grow. If that worked, we could do that all over the whole Southern California renew an entire industry. But I gave it up. Bernard mentioned something's way out there to bite you. Well, it did. The government. He was prison Live wildlife service in the wisdom to set out to fly, fly sea otters from Monterey down and drop them on top of our, our abalone farm. <laughs> and the favorite food of sea otters is abalone. So, it's, uh, if one thing doesn't get you, someone else will. So I, I, I think that the agriculture onshore has promised because you control it more. It's not exciting, but the guys up in the Cayucas and uh, up here in Dos Pueblos, they seem to make a, a steady living growing abalone in tanks onshore. It took long years to learn it, but it does work. There was another part to that question. First of all, there are no gen genetically modified animals used in agriculture in the United States today. Um, there may be in some countries of the world, but not that I'm aware of. Um, the petition to FDA by Aquabounty Technologies to commercialize a gen genetically modified Atlantic salmon was, was based specifically on their application. And their application included a, a commercial grow out in Panama, with a four-phased biophysical security system in place to prevent their escape to the wild. Um, three of those are physical, the fourth is biological. They chose Panama because were an animal to escape, um, it would die in the warm water in the region. Um, there's a process by which you can induce triploidy 
in an animal. And basically what that does is adds an extra set of chromosomes to the genetic complement of that animal. It doesn't alter their behavior or their physiology or their nutritional value, but it does render them sterile. The techniques that are used to do that are usually about 95% effective. So it's not 100%, but that 95% is another of the biological containment barriers that were in place under that petition submitted by Aqua Bounty Technologies. The other two are, are physical security measures to prevent um, release or transport of any of those fish away from the production site. Um, the review that was conducted by the Better Medicine Advisory Committee specifically addressed that. Yes, the, the unintended escape of genetically modified animals into the environment, particularly the marine environment where it would be so difficult um, to try to retrieve them, is well recognized by, by many sectors, both in, in research and academia and government regulatory agencies and um, NGOs. So in the opinion of the experts that were asked to review it, the containment both biological and physical measures that were in that aqua bounty technology application were sufficient, sufficient that they had um, strong assurance that that was not an environmental concern. Should another individual in the United States want to raise an aqua bounty or a genetically modified fish, they would need to go to the FDA with a petition, with a plan that would describe in great detail how that was going to take place, and the FDA would review that as they have for the last 15 years, reviewed the application by Aqua Bounty Technologies. There are people who will say that this fish should not be commercialized, it hasn't been adequately studied, and we just don't know enough. Um, after 15 years of study and millions of dollars of research projects to address particular concerns with this particular animal, um, a committee of experts determined that there was sufficient information and they had confidence in their determination. They would need to access the technology. Sure, next question. This question is for Brent. Uh, in the, I was standing on the banks watching the Niagara Falls last year and saw the power of that river. And I'm thinking of the Amazons and others. With uh, technology improving, could some of this technology be applied in a river instead of farther out offshore in, in an ocean environment and you capture that same energy and, and move it? Yeah, there, there's a, a few companies that are focused on that. One's called Verdant Power, where it's kind of run of river type technology. And, um, you know, they're going through different trials and, and testing their equipment at this point. And uh, in the UK, there's a lot more activity on kind of the tidal, uh, tidal side of things. So it, it can cross over to, to the run of river. got no, no business over on this side, so I've got a question of my own. Um, Brent, the sense I have from the, um, the sense I have from the, um, the Gulf Stream is that that's an enormous source. Could you scale it in relation to the, the energy needs of the east, the east Coast, for example? It seemed to me if you could put several of those down, you could serve most of the eastern seaboard. I don't recall what the, the, the load is on the eastern seaboard, but uh, you could pull out six to 10 gigawatts of power out of the Gulf Stream. And um, you know, that's, half, that's half a dozen nuclear plants right there, to give kind of a frame of reference. I have a question uh, for the whole panel. Uh, maybe five to 10 years ago, there was a proposal uh, by Hub Sea World Institute to repurpose one of the abandoned offshore oil platforms for aquaculture. Uh, I don't think anything happened with that, but I'm wondering, uh, maybe we'll start with you, Brent. Do you see a uh, potential for, for repurposing abandoned offshore oil platforms for your technology? And then, and then to our next uh, panelist for aquaculture. Uh, yeah, I've, I've, I've seen those discussions, been a part of them in some cases, and um, I, you know, I think, uh, you know, the, the resource and the um, scale that you would realize from that, it would be a very localized um, offset to the energy requirements for that platform. Uh, I think it's Irene that's got a um, cable to shore that's 35 kV or something, so that's, you know, a small project, maybe. But I think, you know, where the technology is these days, it's, it's uh, 
that's a ways off. And you know, the early prototyping would not, you'd want to be in a, uh, an environment where you had access to, or easier access to, to, those, to that equipment. Okay. Yes, for the last decade or longer, um, Hub Sea World Research Institute has been interested in developing a demonstration um, facility for commercial offshore culture of fin fish in California. One of their early projects was the Grace Mariculture Project, which was a collaboration that would have used one of the oil platforms as a base of operations, um, locating hatchery facilities on the platform with uh, Cajun net pen culture operations in the general vicinity. Um, they also initiated uh, another project, which would have been conducted in federal waters using net pens. Um, those projects did not uh, proceed, and the primary reason for that is a regulatory environment that's uncertain. I mentioned earlier that uh, both on the federal and state sides, they're in the process of developing aquaculture policies and regulations that would put into place uh, a sense of um, security or assurance or stability that would warrant an investment on the part of an organization that would assure that a lease was in place for a long enough time and that the conditions of occupying that lease um, were such that you could have an economically viable company producing fish? Uh, from, from my experiences uh, working with Ecomar and actually doing scraping the mussels off of the platforms and selling them, uh, as I understand, Ecomar had the only successful mariculture business on oil platforms in anywhere in the world. Um, but I think it was limited. I think when you, you look at a platform, you, it's maybe a quarter acre. Uh, I have 70 acres. Uh, you have this massive liability in the ocean versus um, I have 70 acres of uh, uh, blank can canvas and I can do with it what I want. I can change it up. Um, uh, everything that I put in, I can take out. It's just, it's, I would, uh, yeah, I have no future ever working on a platform again. <laughs> uh, it's, it's very limiting. Uh, you only have so much space to work with. Um, it's, you know, I have 70 acres and, uh, and uh, it's, very, it's very economical to put in my long lines uh, versus you have this massive liability of a platform, even decommissioned, uh, you still have upkeep, you, 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 you're still responsible for it, um, and uh, and then you know if you're not making money, if you lose your butt for a year or two, you're still paying for it. Um, versus uh, what I do is very um, inexpensive. It's cheap. Uh, um, I can move it around. I can change it up. You know, you have to look for the future. What I may be doing now is definitely um, not what I'm going to be doing in five years. Hopefully, a lot more. I'll be changing it up. Uh, just. You know, as I learn, it's just going to, 70 acres allows me to do so much more than a quarter acre platform would. Lots of platforms. <laughs> you know, uh, I've eaten mussels around the world in my diving operations from uh, over Asia, Marseille, France, uh, in, in Holland, and, uh, and I like mussels, but no mussels compare to Santa Barbara mussels. The platforms where maybe when I was growing up, it's offshore. The mussels don't take in one iota of the bottom mud and the smell, the fish smell. They're at several hundred feet off the seafloor, they may as well be out in space. They had, they're inundated with pure salt water, sunshine, wave action, and they actually are sweet. And you can't find those muscles anywhere in the world. So I hope, Bernard, you uh, don't give them those platforms, because I like to get those muscles for me. They're, they're, essentially, they're essentially the same, the same muscles. Uh, we, we grow them the, the, the same way. They don't touch the bottom. Uh, you know, all my, you know, I worked for Ecomar, scraped a lot of muscles in my time. I dove a lot of platforms. I love diving oil platforms. It's an amazing place to dive. I've had a wonderful experience on those platforms, but, uh, uh, for my growth, I, there's, there's lots of viable open ocean that nobody is using that has very little economic 
um, value and very little ecological value. And, you're, and uh, those are the opportunities and places for aquaculture. And in there, you don't have to, um, uh, you know, affect anyone else's business. You know, you're a, your own little entity out there. And uh, even though you are a part of the, the ocean, but, um, um, you know, w w what I do is, you know, I took a piece of ocean that produces maybe a few crabs, a few halibut, no economic value to it. And, and I grew, uh, the last two years, I grew 100,000 pounds of mussels and less than 200,000 oysters that wouldn't have been there had I not done it. And nobody would have used that ocean. I used plankton, you know, plankton, you know, what makes oil. You know, it's, a, a, I don't use any limited resources, uh, limiting re resources except ocean. But uh, um, that's where I see, you know, the, the growth and the, the potential uh, you don't have to conflict with other users or you try to limit the, the conflict with other users and the ecology and um, but uh, but yeah I, I, I dove for I dove almost all the platforms in California. I love diving oil platforms and that's where I got my inspiration. That's where I grew my first oysters were on was uh, platform Houchin and uh, <laughs> I, I wouldn't be there without them. Wouldn't wouldn't be here today without them. I have a question lad. Uh, when we first spoke about opportunities for startups in the ocean, uh, one of the biggest surprises to me is that you brought up, uh, one of the first things that you brought up was sunken treasure recovery. And I'm wondering if you, you might speak a little bit about that. Okay, don't go there. <laughs> uh, there's more treasures people find than there is uh, than I was on trees. And the chance of one of them actually containing a treasure is about zilch. Yeah. If you do find a, a treasure, then, the, then they swarm after the insurance company say it's theirs, the state says it's theirs, and then little people say it's theirs. So it's a fraught with um, almost, almost as many problems as uh, the other thing we're talking about tonight. I had a draw in my office in my corporate headquarters in Texas called the, the Golden Opportunity Draw. And we'd get, because we're a big diving company, uh, people would write or call or something to uh, get our help to raise a sunken treasure. You know? And I called Golden Opportunity, ordered my secretary to put them all in there and don't, don't let me see them. I never saw them. But one was off of uh, Cartagena down in uh, Columbia. Documented up the, up the ging. It held over two billion, three billion, with actually gold recorded parts. And uh, it was a real, real treasure to go after. On the front cover of Life magazine, a known treasure. So, it took me six months to answer these guys' calls. I don't want to even talk to them. Finally, they brought me data, and they brought me the pictures and the, uh, the ship's logs. I said, okay, I'll talk to you about it. And uh, I did. It was all, everything was checked out. Even had. Uh, Capitan in San Jose. And it showed the bottoms, valleys, and mountains. And, but here's a rectangular shape. The same exact spot where the Spanish uh, ships' logs, the English logs, showed they had sunk the Capitan. So, I was on board. Uh, but the U.S. government did not help. Uh, the, the Columbians wouldn't do it with us. This was government, government to government guarantee. Which the U.S. government doesn't do that. So we went to Sweden, and they do a government to government guarantee for peace of the action. So voila, we'll get it. And it would take a saturation system on about a 200 foot barge and a team of divers, a big operation, and support ships. And after it's quite a we, we raised $2 million. So much was more money. Oh, but we're gonna make a fortune and have a good time. And then something always bites you. At the same moment in time, the Colombian cartel broke out and slaughtered all the judges and the 
uh, administrators on the streets of Columbia, uh, all over Columbia. And they let it be known that uh, they weren't going to fool around with us, uh, American people or anybody else. So we had dropped the whole thing. We couldn't have a diver going down 800 feet in saturation, two miles offshore, where they can fly out with a little airplane and drop a little one, five ton, 5,000 pound bomb on, or even 1,000 ton. Or else just go offshore and just harass them with speedboats. Got people's lives at stake, so you can't be doing that kind of stuff. So we had to get all the money back. And uh, the one and only venture in a uh, planning, and once again, it would have been a good idea. So I, I don't believe it. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Well, yeah, great. Uh, hi, yeah, I just had a question for uh, Mr. Olin about um, aquaculture moving away from filter feeders such as mussels and, and scallops and that sort of thing. As far as feed for finfish moving from um, sort of fish-based protein to vegetable-based being added in, what's sort of the latest on that sort of situation moving towards a more sustainable feed for finfish aquaculture? There's some really exciting developments in that field. and. Um, California Secret actually has funded a research project with Hub SeaWorld to look at, at replacing some of the fish meal and feeds. And generally, you can replace fish meal up to about 40%. Um, fish, even, even um, top level piscivorous fish, um, like salmon and tunas, for example, they don't necessarily need fish meal. They need proteins and they need carbohydrates and they need amino acids. It just so happens that fish meal is one of the most affordable means of delivering exactly that suite of, of nutritional factors that they need in their diets. Um, but it is an area I know that the National Marine Fisheries Service has an alternative feeds initiative and there's significant funding um, being provided, I know by the United States and by the EU and by Japan to look at alternative sources of feeds. Um, the commercial fish meal that's available today is, is adequate to supply the animal agriculture industries that use it today and that would be poultry and uh, beef and aquaculture primarily, but everyone recognizes that it's at its maximum sustainable yield. And if we're going to see additional fish produced through aquaculture, we're going to need alternative sources of feeds for them. And I would like to just take one moment. I'm sorry I neglected to, to speak to one aspect of a previous question, and that is the use of uh, any kind of hormones in, in aquaculture. And there are no hormones that are used in any kind of aquaculture today, be it uh, shellfish, crustaceans, or fin fish. Sorry. I have a I have another question. I'm still reeling from Jacques Cousteau's quote about the farming of the ocean, and it occurred to me that I believe Mr. Olin and Brent's industries are under high regulation and leasing the ocean is a big part of the expense. Would either of your businesses be more viable if you could own a piece of ocean, if you could buy a plot and not have to lease it or be under such tight regulation? I don't think anyone that's interested in aquaculture is foolish enough to even suggest that they buy a part of the ocean. Okay. I'm not in the industry, but okay. Have, have any countries thought of that or? I think all the, you know, the, the jurisdictions are, are different for each one. You know, uh, in, in the U.S., we, we deal with FERC, which is the uh, regulatory agency for, for energy, and MMS or whatever, whatever the new name is. and. Um, uh, it's just multiple layers of, of permitting processes. Um, as far as owning the land, um, I think you can make do with, with easements or some other you know, arrangement, but the, the permitting process is fairly cumbersome. Sorry, the question is uh, to Paul Olin. Uh, I wonder if you could speak about the lessons learned with what happened with the uh, uh, salmon industry in Chile when for some type of mismanagement, I'm not sure if it was harm on use or, or uh, uh, I don't remember what happened, but uh, probably like 60 or 80 percent of the, the industry was wiped out a few years ago. Yes, I can speak to that. And what happened in, in Chile was something that we have seen in, in many, many animal agricultural industries. Um, it happened in the early 2000s in, in Canada. And basically you have uh, a firm that's engaged in farming animals and most of them are not uh, proactive in establishing programs to manage animal health 
uh, animal health management programs can be fairly expensive. Um, and historically, most countries don't pay adequate attention to that initially in a proactive fashion. And then what happens is they have a devastating outbreak of disease. As I mentioned, it happened in Canada in the early 2000s. They have since developed a national animal aquatic health management program. Um, the United States has been working for about 10 years to develop a national aquatic animal health program. Um, it's under the very final stages of review now and, and should soon be approved and adopted. Um, Chile started their salmon industry in a very aggressive fashion. It grew very rapidly, and then they were exposed to infectious salmon anemia, which absolutely devastated the industry. They lost uh, in excess of $2 billion of production. Um, they have done what, what every company involved in animal agriculture has done throughout history after suffering devastating losses like that. They've gone to the U.S., they've gone to Norway, and they've gone to Canada and said, you need to help us develop an aquatic animal health management plan because we never want to see this happen again. wondered if there's any progress on the externalities that you mentioned in terms of the true cost of fossil fuels when we look at comparing renewables versus fossil fuels. Um, I, in, the, in the U.S., uh, not so much. Um, it's kind of, you see it more, more in Europe. I mean, right now it's kind of a more philosophical question. So fossil fuels carry the burden of, of you know, acquiring the, the resource in foreign countries and the protections required to, to do that. And, uh, should there be insurance limitations on nuclear power and oil drilling? Uh, we don't have that in, in renewables. There's no liability cap. So if you actually put a price on those, they, those would translate to you know, the price of energy and kind of levelize things a little bit. But I think right now it's kind of more philosophical. I think you know, uh, we have to kind of result, unfortunately, on kind of this tax code. That's how all the, the energy industries been developing over over time, and uh, trying to use wind as a model. Back in the back. Uh, this is a question for Paul. Paul, you uh, showed some stats about uh, sort of the difficulty of, of doing aquaculture today in this country profitably, yet you also. Uh, showed a list of other countries that seem to be doing so. What, what are they doing in Australia and some of the other countries you, you uh, uh, listed that we could learn from here? I think the primary difference is that the opposition to aquaculture in other countries is not nearly as, as well organized and strident as it is here in the United States. In fact, the World Wildlife Fund is in the process of establishing best management practices and certification for just about every species that's produced in aquaculture. I know they've developed, or soon soon will have a finalized version of one for, for bivalve shellfish. They have one for abalone, they have one for shrimp. Um, and in developing one for molluscan shellfish, they said that having traveled throughout the world and listened to farmers and listened to regulators and established guidelines, the only place in the world that there was opposition to shellfish aquaculture was in the west coast of the United States. I can't speak to that. I don't know. Thank you. Uh, Wayne Norris again. Um, we carry a uh, saltwater bias in the state of California because we've got a lot of it and we don't have an, a lot of fresh water. But uh, I didn't hear anything about catfish farming. It seems like there's all sorts of catfish farming all over the United States with the possible exception of right here. Isn't that a, a pretty large industry? I mean, your numbers would suggest maybe not, but uh, in certain places it must be huge. I actually have a lot of statistics on aquaculture production in North America, and catfish is about 50 percent of the production of, of aquaculture in, in the United States. Most of it, say 90 percent of it, is centered in uh, Mississippi, Alabama, or Mississippi, Alabama, and Arkansas, um, in Louisiana to a certain degree. The U.S. catfish industry is on the ropes, um, facing intense competition from imports of uh, Pangasian catfish from primarily Vietnam, where they've had an industry that started about 10 years ago. It's worth about a billion dollars today. Um, they are producing an excellent, high-quality catfish fillet that's in the marketplaces and providing some really, really stiff competition. 
for American catfish producers, such that they're just about at the price point where that, that they cannot be profitably grown in the United States. They're working very, very hard to improve their production, to improve their profitability, and to improve their marketing. Um, but catfish production in the U.S. has dropped pretty significantly in, this, in the last three years. Any more questions tonight? Yep, over here. Hey, Sean Miller here. I had another question for uh, Paul. Um, common stereotype that I've had, at least, of farmed salmon specifically is, you know, the color's a little bit softer, not as, you know, pink is what we think of salmon to be, and, you know, possibly higher mercury levels. And I know that's just a perception that I've had. Um, I'm not actually sure where I've gotten that. Just want to see if you could speak to that. Particularly salmon and your higher, you know, higher fish up the food chain? Sure. First of all, you know, mercury in salmon is not an issue, um, whether it's wild salmon or whether it's farmed salmon. So that's not an issue. There is, there is a perception, um, an obvious uh, opposition to the farming of salmon. And, and I suspect that that has been generated primarily because when salmon farming first began in the early 1980s, we didn't have the cage culture technologies and the cage engineering technologies that we have today. We didn't have the feeds that we have today. Um, we didn't have the vaccines that we have today. And so there, were, there was um, intense criticism of the industry for um, polluting small embayments where net pens were, and that did happen. It happened in the 1980s. Um, fish don't do very well in, in polluted waters. And so the industry very quickly learned that they needed to improve their cage technologies so they could move, move out such that they weren't having um, significant impacts on the benthos, significant impacts on water quality. And that has largely happened. Um, antibiotic use in, in salmon aquaculture is, is down by an excess of 95% over the course of the last 20 years through the result of the development of vaccines to treat some of the most prominent disease problems. And as the industry developed and it evolved, as I mentioned earlier, there were, there were disease problems. Um, the most readily available means to treat those was through the use of antibiotics, and that's what was done. Recognizing that that's not the best way to manage aquatic animal health, vaccines were developed for most of the major um, illnesses that salmon are susceptible to. Um, and one other um, aside to the question about whether people should buy pieces of the ocean, um, to do wind generation or aquaculture. I should say that the most aquaculture throughout the world is really based on leasing of intertidal and subtidal waters. The one place that I'm aware of where that's um, really not the case is in the state of Washington, where in the early 1900s, the state legislature, in order to encourage the development of shellfish aquaculture, um, actually sold um, intertidal and subtidal leases to a number of companies and a large proportion of the shellfish production. Um, in Washington State now, which is over a third of the nation's production, is on privately owned lands. The question in the back. Thank you for the the talk tonight. This is a question about uh, aquaculture, and um, I'm just contrasting the talk tonight with some of the trends in land-based agriculture. So, in land-based agriculture, for the past uh, 30 years, we've had a, a trend in, towards industrialization of agriculture. Uh, mono species, uh, genetically modified species, and we've had a counter trend over the past, say, 20 years towards organic, locally made, you know, food. And listening to the aquaculture uh, discussion tonight, it seemed like uh, the biomass has reached a plateau, and from the panel's perspective, the solution is to shift towards more of an industrial aquaculture model that we're, we're trying to transition out of in land-based agriculture. And I'm wondering if that's, if I'm hearing that accurately, is that, uh, and if not, is there a balance there? You know, what's, what's your view on, the, on those two trends? It's a very complex issue. Um, the U.S. Um, Department of Agriculture has been working for, I don't know, perhaps the last 10 years to identify organic standards for aquaculture products. And to date, they haven't yet come up with an agreement on what that might be. Um, in terms of aquaculture, um, industrial aquaculture, I'm not quite sure what that term means, but certainly aquaculture to be uh, economically viable is going to have to reach a scale um, where fish can be produced and support uh, the investment that's required to do that. It's likely to be on a fairly large scale in order to realize um, that, and I think that's what we will likely see in the future. Um, 
When you look at the magnitude of the seafood that we need in the future, if we're going to continue to eat seafood at the rate we do, or hopefully pretty dramatically increase our seafood production and realize all the health benefits that can flow from that, um, 40 million metric tons of seafood is not going to come from a small operation. It's equivalent to about half of the world's capture fisheries today. It's going to be a, a big and significant endeavor. We have time for one last question. Bernard, I was going to ask you, so if you have a comment as well. If you wanted to uh, double your operation or quadruple it, what would be your process and how long would it take to obtain additional lease to do that? <clears throat> and and how, much, how much additional equipment would you need? <sighs> Walk you through the process. <laughs> Walk you through the process. I'm probably using a third of my lease. Uh, so I... Um, I'm still uh, still scaling up. Uh, you know, I, in the last two years, I, I pretty much lose half of my production um, due to uh, currents, or just I do it wrong. And so I, I'm, I'm learning to um, become more efficient before I scale up, uh, more proficient at what I do. I have room on my lease to do that. I um, I, I think I just hit. This year, I, um, it's like uh, you, you need you need to, everything to work together, and then you need to, you know, and then everything is it's a one year production cycle, so you learn something. It takes a year to learn what what the next step is. I just bought a machine from New Zealand. Uh, it increases my ability to pro, you know, forever. I was hand washing, hand washing stuff. Uh, and this is what. I want to address the previous speaker. Uh, most, I work at the farmer's market. Most farmers I know would love to industrialize. Farming is very hard. You, you know, having some machinery that helps you out, get your products to the market is great. Um, and, and that's what I, you know, I, I used to be able to like, you take like eight hours to do a thousand pounds and now I got this machine I could do 2,000 pounds in the same amount of time. But now, okay, so now, okay, I got this machine that could handle this, this amount of workload. Okay, so now I'm, in the process of building more long lines, putting more seed in it. It's just, it's taking, you, you know, a couple of years to get there. And then, and then, okay, then I'm gonna get all this, like, you know, I'm gonna get to 2,000 pounds, okay, and then I gotta find more markets. And so it's just, it, one feeds the other. And uh, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a battle. Uh, I don't have any guidelines or anyone to show me how to do things. So it, it, it's, a, it's, it's a good year, one year learning curve and, uh, and scaling. And then you, you may get, hit by ducks, by demoic acid, and, and it just knocks you down. It knocks you down. And, and, and <laughs> if you wanted to get the extra lease, who do you go to? What? If, if you wanted to obtain additional 75 the, acres, what's the regulatory process? The, Help us uh, understand that. The, uh, the state has a moratorium on new leases at the moment, but they have promised me that that's going to change this year. Uh, and I would like to get, I would like to start that process and lease more land. Yeah, I, I'm pretty optimistic uh, uh, about my future. And uh, I, I, as soon as they, um, uh, as soon as there's an opening, yeah, I, I have some areas in mind where I would like to open it up. And, and it's just, this, it's a weird gray area. Everyone says, don't do this, don't, you know, never work out. But then somehow you just have to just do it and not be afraid of that process. You know, they like to, they like to make you very afraid. And so, <laughs> they like to scare you. Uh, but if you, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think what I'm doing is right. Um, you know, I provide a wholesome product. Um, I, I try to not do anything wrong. Um, if anybody's got any better ideas, you're welcome to do it. You know, you're welcome to try it out. Um, I, yeah, I'm optimistic. I think I, I'm going to get. I am going to apply for more land, and I'm I'm going to scale my operation. I I don't have a blueprint, um, but uh, you know, if you have an idea, I'm willing to listen. <laughs> Great. Well, I'd like to thank. Uh, please join me in thanking our speakers for sharing your time. Thank you all for coming. One more plug for our event next, uh, next month is Wednesday, February 16th. Uh, Andrew Siebold, 
uh, international re renowned expert in the field of mobile technology and network infrastructure. Thank you. Good night. Celle qui me fait toujours entrer gratuit Je cherche ma fantomette La fée des fêtes, la fée des bars Ma fée clochette qui me fait toujours entrer trop tard C'est une jolie fillette Qui me fait coucou toutes les nuits À travers un verre de whisky